once again to thank the Lord for fulfilling this day and for honoring me with the opportunity to speak to a great audience like the one that is before me. I'm extremely honored because I know that in here there are future commissioner generals, there are future ministers, there are future presidents, they are mighty men of God and women. And an opportunity for me to speak to you at this point is a great honor. I trace back the days I was in school like yourselves, and I remember the words of wisdom that were spoken to me through the different vessels that the Lord used. They shaped my being today. I owe them a lot. And one of them is Uncle Paul. I first met Uncle Paul around the time he mentioned when we met at the university. But he was already a spiritual leader. He was a minister of the Lord. He used to play the keyboard. And from that interaction, we became friends. So I thank God for you, Paul. I thank God for my brother, Professor Aaron Mshenges, who is not here today, but I also knew him around the same time. Now, time is running out fast, so let me go straight into the word. Father, I pray that the words of my mouth shall be pleasing before you and that the ears of your children and their hearts will be set and be prepared to receive your word for the glory and honor of your most precious name, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The topic today is laying a solid foundation for integrity in the marketplace. When I saw this theme, I said, what does the word integrity mean for starters? And as I looked through my dictionary, I found many words to describe the word integrity. But very importantly, integrity was defined as being honest and having strong moral principles. As I looked on further, I came across words like uprightness, ethics, morals, nobility, uh, being decent, sincere, and truthful. But again, from the point of the marketplace where I serve today, I also have some fair understanding of what the word integrity means. And integrity indeed at the workplace means things like honesty, loyalty, respect, responsibility, keeping your promise, upholding the core values of an institution, be it a university like UCU, Mukono, be it an institution like URA, knowing the core values of that institution and upholding them is integrity. Reducing errors that can sometimes be costly is integrity. Being honest, even about the things that go wrong, is integrity. We are all human beings. There is a time when we error. There is a time when we forget. There is a time when some important tasks slip through our, our hands and we are not able to deliver them on, t on time. What happens when such a thing happens? The best thing for us to uphold integrity is to own up and apologize and do it right the next time. So in short, integrity from the, market, uh, from the marketplace is being reliable and dependable. And I want to assure you, even before I go any further, that this true core integrity is in very short supply. You spend the day, you look around, looking for someone you can trust with a sensitive assignment, who will not only keep the information confidential, but will do it to the very end. And you are lucky to find one or two. Therefore, the world is in short supply of integrity, and the world is yearning for integrity. And it gives me joy to meet a young community like the one I'm speaking for now, who are seeking ways of how they can uphold integrity and how they can lay a firm foundation for integrity in the marketplace that is just ahead. Let me go now to the text that has been given to us from 1 Samuel chapter 12. 
And this was the reading that has just been read by the Reverend. Samuel 12, uh, starting from verse 1. This is a statement of integrity from a servant of God, a king and a prophet by the names of Samuel. Samuel was giving an accountability of what he had gone through, of how he had served from the time he started his service up to the time when he was retiring. And he had these words to say. But maybe to put this word in context, let's start from the first chapter of that book of Samuel, because that will tell us who Samuel was. Starting from verse 1 of chapter 1, the Bible tells us that Samuel was the son of a man called Erkana. Erkana had two wives. One wife was called Penina, and the other was Hannah. Hannah was the mother of Samuel. And the Bible tells us that Hannah did not have any child. Her co-wife, Penina, had many children. And because of that, Penina used to taunt Hannah and mock her because of the jealousy that exists in our minds as human beings. So Hannah was a woman who was afflicted. No child, although he was loved by Elkanah, the Bible tells us, Hannah was a sad woman. What did she do about her sadness? Hannah went to the Lord in the times of pain. Please, when you get time, read this story from the first chapter of Samuel. Very interesting. The Bible tells us that every time they would come from offering the sacrifice, Penina was at her game, mocking Hannah, saying, why do you waste time in prayer? What, does, what has the Lord done for you? See, me who doesn't pray, I have children. And that used to sadden Hannah. But Hannah was a woman of faith. She said, I know my Lord. One day he will come through for me. And the Bible tells us that one day Hannah became desperate. You can read this from verse uh, 8 going forward. Hannah became desperate. He said, enough is enough. Lord, please remember me. Lord, remember your servant. I'm tired of being mocked. I'm tired. There is no word of comfort that could ca calm down Hannah's cry. The husband took her aside and said, but you know I love you. And I more than ten sons to you. Why do you still cry? The Bible tells us that Elkanah would come and serve his wives. But for Hannah, the one who had no children, he would give her a double portion. But even that kind of love would not take away Hannah's pain. So Hannah goes to the temple and she starts to pray desperately. And the Bible tells us that the prophet Eli saw Hannah and for a moment she thought she was drunk. And while she was coming out, he said, but you man, for how long will you come? Will you continue to come into the house of the Lord when you are drunk of wine? But Hannah explained to Eli that I'm not drunk. I'm just here because I have pain. And Eli told him, may the Lord answer you and give you your heart's desire. Praise be to Jesus. So I was highlighting that background of Hannah to tell you that the integrity of Samuel did not just begin with Samuel. It started from a praying mother. And I want to thank the Lord for the praying mothers that have brought up most of us. It started from a faithful mother who did not only pray, but if you read on the following chapters, you'll see she made a pledge to the Lord. He said, just give me one son, only one, and I will give him back to you. He will be your servant. He will serve you. So Hannah was not just praying for her own need to have a son. She was also looking at an opportunity for that son to serve the Lord. And as you read on, you will discover that later on in chapter 3, indeed, Hannah carried uh, Samuel to the temple at the age of three. As soon as he went him off the breast, he took him to the temple and 
he took him to Eli and he said, this is the son I prayed for. The Lord kept his bargain. He gave me the son and here I return him to you. So that is integrity of Hannah. Now Samuel builds on that integrity also to start serving the Lord. At age three, he starts to minister and serve the servant of the Lord Eli. As he grows up, he grows up as a young man of distinction, different from his own environment. The Bible tells us that Eli had two other sons. One of them was called uh, Phinehas, and another was called um, Phinehas, and the other was called uh, Hophin. So Hophin and Phinehas were sons of prophet Eri, brought up and grown in the same environment as Samuel himself. But Samuel became a man with a distinction. While Phinehas and his bro brother went into acts of extortion, when they started acts of immorality, Samuel said, no, I know why I'm here. I'm here to serve the Lord through his prophet Eri. So integrity, therefore, of Samuel starts to kick in. The foundation has been laid by the mother, prayed for her, took her to church, dedicated her to the Lord, as we all have gone through that channel. But a time came when Samuel had now to stand out and define his own uh, integrity. And he went before the Lord and he said, here I am to serve you. I will not digress from the call. So the Bible tells us that Samuel served the Lord honestly until such a time in chapter 3 when God earmarked and noted the integrity of Samuel. And once he had noted that, he chose Samuel to be the priest and the king after Eri because the children of Eri had uh, digressed from the way of their father. And therefore, integrity is both the, what we learn from our parents, the foundation that our parents laid for us when they prayed for us, when they nurtured us, when they took us to church. But again, integrity is our personal relationship with the Lord. Because Samuel could have thrown away that foundation of Hannah and took the path of Phoenicus, but he chose not to. And the Bible tells us clearly that he served the nation of Israel as king and prophet up the time of his retirement. And when he was leaving, this is when he gave this account. Samuel said to Israel, I have listened to everything you've said and have set a king over you. Now you have a king as your leader. As for me, I'm old and gray, and my sons are here with you. I have been your leader from my youth to this day. Here I stand. Testify against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? This is someone who started serving that early as a young boy. He's now retiring as an old man, and he's asking the whole nation of Israel, Whose ox have I taken? They all answered, no one. Whose donkey have I taken? They all answered, nobody's donkey have you taken. He said, when have I received a bribe so as to pervert justice? And the audience said, no time in all the time we have known you. What a beautiful testimony for Samuel. That Samuel had served the Lord and his people with integrity. As I read this word, I just started moving forward and asking myself, the time I'll be leaving this position as Commissioner General, will I stand and be able to give such a testimony? By the grace of God, I can assure you I'll give that testimony. <clears throat> I have not and I will not receive a bribe so as to avert justice. I have not, and I will not take anybody's ox. I will not oppress anybody because 
I have discovered the root of integrity. I want to thank the Lord Jesus Christ. I see time is running out very fast by giving you my own personal testimony. I was born and I grew up in a home of a reverend. My father is one of the pioneers of this great institution of Mukono. He went to be with the Lord uh, about five years ago. My own mother is a retired teacher, but a servant of the Lord. So I grew up in this foundation that was more or less like Samuel's. They took me to church, they prayed for me, they dedicated me, they baptized me, they confirmed me all on time. But as I grew up as a young man and joined Ntari school, I started to adventure and no life on my own. So I gave up going to church. I would only go if I'm drugged. There, I stopped praying, and within a short time, I had lost track of the foundation that my parents had set for me. But I want to thank the Lord for the grace. In senior two, in 1988, I was just 14 years of age. Missioners came to church, and I was not interested in going for that mission. But when they were just about to end, one of the students who had attended came back shouting. He said, John, you have missed. You are here sleeping. I was sleeping. I think I had a hangover. I had started drinking. So he said, you are here sleeping. You cannot imagine what you have missed. The most beautiful women from Makerere University <laughs> are the ones ministering in the main hall. So I ran. I don't know <laughs> what was it with women. Because I was just 14, I didn't even know what to do with those women. But I went running to see the beautiful women from Makerere. And when I had just entered, they sang the last song and they got off the platform. So I was determined to walk away because what had brought me had ended <laughs> very shortly. As I was moving out, I met my chaplain. I thank God for chaplain. Thank you, Uncle Paul. You are doing a great job. When <laughs> When you see some young people walking away from here, be bold enough to hold them. So there was this chaplain who held my hand and said, where are you going? He knew me as a son of a reverend. Where are you going, you son of reverend? <laughs> Sit here and listen to the gospel. <laughs> so that day I listened to the gospel by force, <laughs> courtesy of the chaplain. And I want to tell you, by the time they made the altar call, I was the first one to walk in front. I had discovered what a great privilege I had thrown away by choosing to walk a different path than what I had found in my father's home. So I gave my life to Jesus and I reconnected to the Lord and that defined the rest of my walk until much later in life. I ministered with Uncle Paul at the university. We went for missions. We reached out. It was a fantastic time. I want to encourage you, those who are saved, sink yourselves into the measurable and abundant grace that is in this age of life. Seek the Lord with all your heart. Besides your books, pray. Seek the Lord. When there is an opportunity to go for mission, go for it because it will define who you are. I stood out. I served the Lord. I remember at a time when I was graduating, I had not even graduated, I had just finished my exams. I had gone with Uncle Paul to minister in a church in my village. He has already told you, he was a child to my parents. They love him dearly. So my father invited Uncle Paul to come and speak to us in Rishere. And while we were at the pulpit preaching, Paul was preaching and I was interpreting. Guess what happened? The president drove in. And as he drove in, we went on with our message. He was not expected that day. But at the end of the sermon, when he was greeting us, he asked me, young man, what did you study? I said, I've just completed a degree in mathematics at Makerere. So you can count, I said, I can. And you are saved, I said, I'm saved. <laughs> that is how I got my first job. <laughs> I was appointed 
to work in a team that was verifying the actual strength of the army. If you remember 97, it was the climax of Konyi War. We spent two years in Gulu Barracks, not even one day to go out and pray because the rebels were everywhere. But by the grace of God, we served that assignment with excellence. We were met with so much pressure to compromise us. They would bring bags of money because we used to save billions that were being lost. They would corner us and I was the team leader. They would say, we can give you this. I told them, never. I have been trusted by my leader and my government. I will never sell. And we stood through that pressure. As we finished cutting short, I was given the next assignment by the head of state. He said, now help me fight smuggling in URA, just like you have helped me to clean the army. So I mounted a big team to come and help me. We went into URA. We fought with smuggling against so much pressure to give in to corruption, so much uh, intimidation, but the Lord sustained us. We served up to the end. One of the assignments that the Lord gave me, and by his grace I accomplished, the president sent me for 200 young people, fresh graduates. So I went all over the universities looking for men and women of integrity. There were many relatives of mine, but I said no. My relative may have the integrity, but if I take him, it will show that I'm trying to find employment. So I took people that I didn't know, and they turn around these institutions. Some went to URA, others went into the army. I'm so proud of them when I see them today. Most of them are generals, and I salute because the Lord has used them. But what was the foundation? Integrity. As looking for people that fear and honor the Lord. I want to thank the Lord for our president. He's one man who has always been seeking out